Hey y'all, so welcome to my hair appointment. We are back. This one for black maternal and reproductive health. We cannot wait to get this one started with Dr. Jocelyn Slaughter. It's going to be dope, y'all. She's going to keep it real. So hang out. Um, how y'all doing? Hey, Candy. And this is Nubia. That's pretty. I'm in a good mood. It's been a long day, but it's been a good mood. Hey, Michelle, thank you for joining. Can y'all hear the music? Hey, hey, Jazzy. <laughs> Yay. It's going to be a good one, y'all. Yes, it's been a move. So <laughs> Michelle knows I just came from another meeting. So I had to, uh, I was doing a lot in that meeting. So just shout out to black people, supporting black people. Here we go. Dr. Slaughter is on. Hey, Kay. Hey, Catherine. Hey. How are you, Dr. Slaughter? I am doing so well. I'm so excited. Hey, we've got so many questions already. So much feedback already. So That is awesome. Let me adjust my stuff real quick. No problem. Take your time. And oh. I have to, like, get my tea, like, <laughs> sit on myself. We have a lot to talk about, okay? We so do. We have a lot to talk today. about. <laughs> and so hopefully we can get through. I know y'all can have questions. If you have questions, be sure to put it in the Q&A. Uh, the question mark below so that way we get the alert because it's going to be really hard to go through the thread to get all the questions y'all but we'll we'll try to get as many questions as possible all right so first of all um this is my hair appointment it is starting with today's newest series for black women to explore cultivate and define our own wellness and um it's just like the, the beauty shop no topic is off the table we can talk about everything and um but this part we like to bring in experts so it's just not you know your auntie saying something your girlfriend <laughs> saying something nobody has a medical degree nobody <laughs> you know it's licensed in anything so this time we want to bring in some experts to it so we can have some really um productive conversations around black women and black women's health mental health physical health um and taking care of our mind body and spirit in a world that doesn't really care um and so that's why we're bringing um, Dr. Slaughter. She is a, a medical OBGYN. She's based out of the Atlanta area. She's a Howard grad, uh, Bison's in the house, of course, Bison. Um, so anything else we should know about you? You have two medical practices. She's yes. a big boss. Like Dr. Boss business. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying. I have two offices, two practices, and they're booming. We are busy. We're about to expand one of the offices next year because we just have a lot of patients because a lot of patients want to come to us because they know that we really care about our patients. Um, I have two daughters, um, six and two, and they are all the way live. <laughs> I'm also a cheerleading assistant coach for the first and second grade Brookwood Broncos. Go Broncos. I love and that. And so every Saturday, I'm not Dr. Slaughter. I'm just Coach J. Love that. Love that. That is so amazing that you still find time between motherhood and doctorhood and giving back. You know, I really think that truth and service just goes really deep, even for you making time here for us today. So greatly appreciate you, your Thank time, you. your gifts. Uh, for sharing with us. So for this one, we're talking about Black maternal and reproductive health. And I let me say, I've been telling everybody, I learned so much from my 20-minute call <laughs> stuff. I had never heard in my entire life. Like, no one had never shared with me. Um, so we'll try to get to, into it and um, get started. So one thing you brought up that we I hadn't really thought about from the lens of um, maternal health is from slavery to now. You know, mm -hmm. um, how Black women were brought here in our roles in American society. Can you speak a little bit about that and how um, America sees Black women and then how our own community sees Black women? 
Yes, we were, I've had a lot of thought about this and why black women are treated differently in pregnancy and, and what is it? Well, we are the descendants of slaves. So our perception in America specifically is that we are hard workers, that we are kind of a thoroughbred. And so that's one of the problems is that the way that other people perceive us is that we are here to work, that we're strong, that we um, don't feel pain. And if you look in our history, we're just not doted over. You know, I, we had a conversation when I first started with you and I said, you know, when I'm in my office, I have lots of patients from different races. And I always see, especially before pre-COVID, when the spouses would come, the family would come, the mothers would come, there was always such a, you know, the, the, the white patients or other races and, you know, Indian cultures, their families just, just doted over them. They, they, they were just, oh, no, you can't do this because you're pregnant. And, 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 and oh, 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 my God, oh, my God. And so they were just treated like this process was such a, a, um, a delicate time in their life. Mm. But Black women, they're not treated that way. It's, okay, you're pregnant, that's fine, but, you know, you can still... <laughs> come do this work, you can still, um, you know, break these kids' hair. And so, and that's what we've always seen. So it's the, it's our society views us that way, but also Black people, um, we don't see our mothers, you know, when if any of us were there to see our mothers be pregnant with our siblings, we weren't, our family wasn't surrounding them with, oh, no, no, you can't do this, or no, you have to put that down. They were still cooking Thanksgiving dinner, going to work, cleaning houses, and also the the spouses and the men. We don't know how to to dote and to care for our women during pregnancy. Pregnancy is not, you know, this easy breezy time. Mm. Um, my old piano teacher used to tell me, pregnancy, you got one foot in the grave and the other one on the banana peel. Miss Reynolds, bless her, bless her soul, but pregnancy is 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 hard it's hard and, and recently um you know black women are oh why are they dying so much oh my god well you know it's a really stressful time and it's hard and black women are always working those are always my patients who want to work till they go into labor it's a labor in maternity leave miss jones uh well i'm trying to work up until i go into labor the other patients, 36 weeks, 34 weeks, but, and it's, and it doesn't matter how much money you make. This is super educated women, people that don't have a lot of money. We're all trying to continue working, be the breadwinner for the family, help mama make sure she go to her appointments, help this, help these kids. And so during this time in our life of, of pregnancy and childbirth, where our health, everybody's health is tested, we're not protected. And so that's what I was talking about was we've never been able to see, especially in America, right? Black women just be protected and, oh, no, no, don't lift that. Oh, no, no, no. And I know even myself, I'm a physician. My family is educated. And I feel like, you know, that, that a lot of us have, you know, the, we're, we're lucky in a sense, but we're still, and me and my friends, we're still subject to the same thing. Right. When we go through pregnancy saying, I'm pregnant, but I'm going to do this, that, and that, and I want to have this, and I want to have this time. And so that's one of the big things is our view from slavery to now is not this precious little frail person. It's a strong woman who can have a baby and go back in the field and keep picking cotton. And that's so true. And it's not even like when we think about slavery and then we think about domestic workers, black women were domestic workers. I mean, even to the 70s, right? So we're not far removed to, um, and some still are. So it's just like, we're not far removed from that ideology, from that from that role that people see us in. And um, I think you, you touched on something about debunking that strong uh, black woman narrative. And, you know, and we talked too, and it's like, um, in my own personal story, I was pregnant and I, I carried up to 36 weeks and lost the baby. And I felt like, um, Not and me so talking sorry. that is just the, was the, one of the worst things a woman can go through. Yes, it, it was. And I feel like it, but it, it gave me a lot of perspective, right? I think from that point, I began to really have a vision for starting with today, even before we launched, um, I knew how fragile mental health was. And so I began to think about these intersections between, disparity between our health and um, 
our mental health, right? Because I had a white doctor at Georgetown um, or, you know, non-black, white presenting, um, who I complained every single visit up until the last visit. Like, I was sick. I couldn't hold food. I was having all these issues. I kept asking. I didn't know who else to compare it to. She just said it was just part of the pregnancy. I don't have anything else to compare it to, so I'm taking her word for it. Um, but all these signs that probably should have led to, that, hey, getting more testing, um, uh, you know, more screening, or taking it easy. Probably should have been on bed rest earlier, you know. Um, and, but just not being heard in that. And then this thing we'll talk about where black women, this threshold for pain, and we'll talk about Serena Williams, um, you know, having to advocate for herself, even in the mix, midst of delivery. Um, we just heard about Christy Teagans losing her um, child, unfortunately. And so all these stories, I believe, sharing them um, gives people some voice and say, hey, we this is a burden that we need to make sure that we don't have to carry this this badge of trying to be so strong all the time, and especially especially when it comes to our pregnancies. Yes, as I told you before, and I tell my patients, black girl magic does not exist. It, it, it's no magic. It's survival. We're surviving, yeah. but it's not anything magical, and we are not healthier or stronger than anybody else. And one of the things that we that 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 we touched on a little bit was how we are perceived by others in the hospital. Now, I have, I'm, I'm in the hospital, I'm around doctors, I'm around a whole bunch of people, and we know that Black people don't get the same amount of pain medicine, mm -hmm. we don't get um, the same amount of um, the, the nursing calling out, asking for this, asking for that, we're sitting in the waiting room, and part of it is an acceptance, that when somebody tells you, okay, well, you can't have it, we're just like, oh, oh, okay, sure. But, you know, it's this, that kind of, you know, we're not the Karens, can I speak to your manager type of people. Right. But if we start to question, we're looked as combative, as attitudinal, oh, she got an attitude, you know, oh, she's on her phone, she's okay. Well, I'm on the phone because I'm trying to get somebody to watch my kids. Right. So... You know, I, I think that people, not everybody really understands us, but if you know that, hey, this group of people is one of the most marginalized and disrespected people, maybe when they come in, we should really listen to what they say and make sure that we're not just brushing them off. Um, it's, it, it's very disheartening, but I have colleagues and, and people that I know who are not this, my race that are great and take care of women and listen to them, but you also have to know that you have an inherent prejudice, that we all have prejudices of, about us. And in the medical field, those prejudices can be deadly. So yeah. we have to make sure that we are overly protecting these women, overly making sure that, that, that we're, we're not missing anything. And um, um, I've had patients, I know my patients, we were talking about this a lot of times, the, yeah. the art of medicine, especially OBGYN has changed. Um, if you talk to your mom or your aunts or grandmothers, they knew their OBGYN from the time they had their positive pregnancy test. Probably they took care of somebody else they knew. And now you may know your OBGYN, but especially when you go into labor, you got a group of five doctors. It's mm -hmm. a dice roll of whoever's going to take care of you when you go to the hospital, and they may not know you. And so these big, large practices have also, I believe, contributed to mm. a lot of the miscommunication and not understanding what women are going through because they don't know them. So right. you, as a physician, you know, you get a call, Mrs. Jones is in labor and she says she's got a headache and you, uh, let me look at my phone, uh, uh, who is that? Me, right. I know my patients. Oh, oh, for real, oh yeah, I, I know her. She doesn't have headaches. This is totally different, you know, let's do this. So that's another thing is that of Obstetrics has changed. Now, there are some modes that we talked about, like midwives, doulas, mm -hmm. people that can help advocate for patients. Right. But let's talk a little bit about birth. Okay, let's talk about it. I'm ready. Let's go back to birth. So birth traditionally, childbirth was a group activity Whoa. between you, probably your mama was there, you had some sisters there, you had family there. It was a, it was a, a group kind of effort to help you, this is again, when I'm talking about group activity, I'm talking about before epidural, mm. before anything else, because to go through childbirth without pain medicine or epidural is 
very difficult. Some people die just because of pain. And some people, you know, have complications. So wow. it was a thing that people went through together. And it was a time where you didn't know if you were going to make it to the end. Mm. So the people that were around you when you're almost passed out, can't say this, they're, they're in your corner. They're saying, no, 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 help, help her. Or, you know, we need to do this. Somehow childbirth got changed to just a thing that happens between a man and a woman or, you know, two partners. And um, especially because of COVID, we really can't have a lot of people in the rooms. But even before that, there wasn't a community that surrounded women during pregnancy and childbirth. And that's what you need. You need to be able to have somebody right there. Is this normal? My feet are kind of slow. What you think? Right. Or, you know, what? I got a headache. And, oh, your auntie was right there. No, you need to go to the hospital right now. Right. I've had patients that, I remember I had this one patient. And she was calling and she was like, yeah, you know. My, my auntie said my legs were swollen and I was like well I was like but do you have a, I don't have a headache and I checked my blood pressure and they thought it was high and so in my mind I'm kind of like this doesn't really sound like a problem but just come on in Be, it's only because her aunt told her to do it mm. she comes in full blown, blown preeclampsia I'm talking about I'm like what and I would have told her to stay home mm. well, her aunt, happened to see her and was like, this isn't normal. And so we don't have a lot of that. We don't have people right. around us to say pregnancy is hard. And a lot of people don't have a lot of pregnancy. So before your mom might have five, six kids, you probably saw her pregnant at least twice. Now you're only having a couple of kids. You may go your whole, you know, early adulthood without really seeing somebody pregnant or understanding what they're going through. So I have a lot of patients who know nothing like, uh, you know what a you know what a contraction is? No, you know that you know you you're gonna have to what? Because and and it's not that I'm like oh they're so stupid. It's just that they they really have no frame because right. we're not open with pregnancies. We're not open about miscarriages. I have patients who think who don't even know that miscarriage is a possibility mm. because they don't know anybody who's had a miscarriage. Wow, and that's ridiculous. I've had a miscarriage. I've had friends wow. that had miscarriages, but wow. we don't talk about. It. We don't talk about and it. And so you think that if it happens to you, then something's wrong with you mm -hmm. or that this is just, you know, horrible. Now, stillbirth, again, is very rare, but women do have it. And to know that somebody else has gone through that helps women understand that it's okay. Yeah. But we we're, we're, we're do everything in privacy and just want to show up at the hospital and have this amazing experience. And, and are not really fully aware of what's going on. And that's a cultural thing. That's an American thing. Okay. That is really good. You touched on so much. Um, so we talked about uh, family support. What about mm -hmm. physical support? Like, what should it look like for, you know, people who are pregnant? What the community members should look like? You know, you kind of talked about how, you know, it's a community affair, but like, I'm thinking about more like maybe we should be helping women when we see them pregnant, pick up the groceries and, you know, volunteer. What do you feel like that looks like um, in our community to help with physically supporting a woman while she's pregnant? Well, I think that that's very key. Physically supporting them, the community, seeing this as a blessing. First mm -hmm. of all, a lot of times we don't even see somebody getting pregnant as a blessing. You see a little 16 year old girl on sure. the bus pregnant, everybody rolling their eyes. Oh, my God. But it's a blessing. It and, is. And so that's the one thing is to, yes, it, we would rather people have planned pregnancies, but guess what? The majority of us can come from unplanned pregnancy. My okay. mom and daddy were married, but they weren't planning to have me. Right. So, you know, it's it's not this, oh my God, we need to we, we, we need to be excited about birth, not encourage it. But right. if somebody's pregnant, you know, wrap them around, you know, they, mm -hmm. they should still be, once we get back from COVID, coming to church and participating in things and seeing people um, so that people can wrap them, you know, wrap their arms around them. Um, but I also think that especially for jobs, let's talk about this. I had a whole thing about this. So I had a thought. So I was like, okay, why is it now? Why is it now that black women are just dying in pregnancy? You know, we, it, it, it hasn't been like racism is, you know, was so much better back then. Right. But part of it was, the maternity leave and expectations of pregnancy of what you're doing in pregnancy was so much less. My mother, she was pregnant with me. I was born in November. She was a teacher, calculus teacher. She didn't go back to work until like May. Wow. Okay. 
But that was normal to take Mm -hmm. three, four months off. Now, employers and the society is looking at women to be bounced back, snap back, ready for work in six weeks, which is ridiculous. So that's one of the things is that, you know, if you in your mind already know, dang, I only got six weeks. Dang, I got to, you know, I got to make the most of it instead of I'm about to have a nice long time with my baby mm-hmm. and, you know, really work on breastfeeding and I don't have to worry about money. So that's one of the things is that we think that pregnancy is, is this, this this nine months and then this quick postpartum and you should be back at work or back mothering or back parenting. Right. Or, and, and you shouldn't have time to just, heal mentally and physically so i think that we need to have a lot lower expectations of our pregnant women and when you're pregnant you should have lower expectations you shouldn't have to you know educational systems should be much more um you know like um grace you know just giving them grace to say hey okay you're pregnant not okay if you don't if you're not here you got to repeat your whole year right that's a yeah. huge amount of stress on somebody to to really think about that now I'm worried due to this whole pregnancy that I might fail out of my college class. So I, I think that- if Or you lose your job. Or lose, or your, lose your job. Or, right. your, or, your, or your, your position in the company. And I feel like so much we, Black women just keep taking on projects and we feel like we can't pass it off or anything because A, um, you know, we feel like we'll not be seen as, mm-hmm. you know, competent or whatever during our pregnancies. Yes, and, and that, and a lot of people, even if they're married or, um, you know, they're still ashamed of letting an employer know that they're pregnant, you know, mm-hmm. because they're like, oh, goodness, you know, I'm yeah. pregnant. It's a wonderful thing. I tell people, and this is the funniest thing, in the physician world, especially the OBGYN world, people who are the OBGYN doctors are so afraid to become pregnant. Wow. They're, because... You know, other people, even women, would look at them like, oh, God, you're pregnant, so now I got to take all your call. Mm. So, you know, when, when I was in training, I trained at Grady Memorial Hospital in the Morehouse Residency Program. And when young women would become pregnant in training, you know, they were encouraged to get back between four and six weeks, okay? And if you didn't, you might have to repeat a this or that. And so, you know, even our own community, I have friends who are afraid of becoming pregnant because they don't want to make their their employer mad. Mm. And I'm like, do you know that your baby that you could have may one day grow up to be the the um doctor that saves his life 20, 30 years from now? Yeah. So we shouldn't look at pregnancy as this, oh gosh, she's pregnant. Now I gotta change everything. And so I'm an employer. So I'm I own my own practice. And and for my employees, that's one of the big things that we talk about is I want, if you want to have a baby, I want you to feel good. I want you to know that you have, you know, this is the amount of time you have off financially. This is what I can do for you, wow. you, you know, but I don't want you to be afraid of becoming pregnant. When I had my children, I was very blessed to have my own practice so that I didn't feel so worried about, I got to, you know, do this. So now I want other people to have that experience to not feel that. So employers need to be much more understanding with their pregnant Absolutely. employees. Um, and as a society, like you said, if we see somebody pregnant, we need to say, well, how can I help you? Do you need help to your car? Mm-hmm. Do you need this? You know, and sometimes it's just money. If you know your niece or cousin is pregnant and you know she's struggling, see how she's doing. Does she need any type of financial assistance? Does she need any type of help with child care? Um, we, you know, everybody's like, oh my God, black women are dying, but who wants to help us? We need Oof. help. We Oof. need help. When you, if, if you over there not helping your niece who's pregnant and rolling your eyes at her, Woo. but, but when you hear on, you know, Serena Williams, like, oh, this is awful, but we need to help our black women, all black women. All black women. And you know, you brought up a good point too, and I knew for me, like having my own business and having my nonprofit would be key because I was like, I want to be able to take off as much time as I need to the next time I'm pregnant. Like, I don't want to leave it to chance. I was working full time. I was working 50, 60 hours a week. I was walking, taking the metro. It was just a lot. And I was like, I never want to have that experience again. And like, how do I begin to cultivate my life to to be a nourishing environment, but I have to be, be intentional. And then even that's like so many sacrifices and chances um, that we have to take. And let's talk about, um, for me, once I lost my child and I felt the, 
the black OBGYN, I mean, the, the white OBGYN I had was just so uh, despondent, right? Wow. Um, I mean, she, she showed some sympathy, but even the, when I actually got admitted to the hospital, um, it, the black doctor who actually delivered uh, my child was just night and day difference. Night and day, emotionally supportive, you know, making sure my parents were okay. They were flying in, making sure they got the information, making phone calls, all this stuff she didn't have to do. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. um, And so I knew from that one moment forward, I was never, ever going back. I need black doctors every <laughs> turn. Um, but you have made a point that black patients and with well, black doctors have better outcomes. Can you yeah. speak a little bit about that besides the obvious, right? And, right. Um, I know there's not enough black doctors for black patients, but then how do we begin to advocate for that? And what does that mm -hmm. look like ideally? Right. Well, that's a big thing is that, yes. And if there's, it's in every specialty, there was this big thing about um, P, um, babies and, you know, um, infants that um, they had a better rate with black doctors, black babies. And I have black pediatrician friends, so I, 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 I can attest to that. But like you said, there is not enough of us to go around. Black female doctors make up, I think, 2% of physicians. That's it. 2%. You know how 2%. hard it was to find a black OBGYN? We had I to do know. a Twitter call. We had to do a Facebook call. We had to, like, put the stars out. <laughs> right. And, you know, and, and like the, I'm, I'm in Georgia. I'm in Atlanta. So we've got, you know, I've got a lot of black, you know, female colleagues. So it's, it's, it's great. But how do we help? Well, in the training, we need to train medical people to be aware of the biases internal and the systematic kind of oppression of black women so that they can be prepared to help them. I'll give you an example of how this has happened before with another race. When anybody who's in medical school, we always knew about this Ashkenazi Jewish race. Okay. And I had never even heard of, and I'm from the South Side of Chicago. I'm like, what is, what is this? But it was in every textbook because those group of people were at a higher risk of cystic fibrosis and some of the other um, genetic traits. So whenever we would see that, it would, it was like a ding dong. And you can look at any medical person and be like, you know, Ashkenazi Jews who's like, oh my God, oh my God, we need to make sure we're doing this, make sure we're doing that because they can have this and they can have that. Well, why can't that be for us? Mm. You know, why can't it be training where, hey, if you're taking care of a of a black person, then especially a black woman in childbirth, you need to be aware, put your ears up, check that blood pressure again, mm. make sure the pharmacy is correct that she's going to make sure she has follow up. Like these people have a higher rate of death. The and I have a little statistic that we have everybody's been hearing. The National Center for Health Statistics says that Black women are two and a half um, chances, times more likely to die than a white person mm. um, during childbirth. So if we have the data that this race is at a high risk of death, then why can't we train people to be more aware of that? And, okay. and as they say, check, you know, check every box, cross every T, dot every I when you have um, a, a Black patient, especially a pregnant one. So mm -hmm. I think it's ways that can happen. Um, um, it's, you know, as, as physicians, we have to do our part. We have to see as many people as we can. I think that um, doing stuff like this, you know, yeah. there are a lot of people that, you know, look at me and they're like, you know, you're a doctor. Yeah, I'm a doctor. And I'm, you know, I'm going to be real with you all and, and being real with your patients. And I love that. Doctors have to be teachers, okay? Ooh. I wanted to be a teacher when I was growing up. My mom's teacher, everybody my family teacher. Uh -huh. And doctor is actually Latin for teacher. So mm. if a doctor can teach a patient, that patient, and really they can understand, can go on and teach other people. So we have to be able to teach our patients. And it is not a quick thing to do. It, you know, I sometimes sit with my patients and I'm talking to them. My staff is like, oh, my God but I have to make sure this person understands what I'm saying because they may be able to help somebody else, help their friend. No, my doctor said, if you have a headache and your blood pressure is high, you're pregnant, you could have preeclampsia. You need to come on and come to this hospital. Mm -hmm. well, if I didn't have this long conversation with them and educate them, right. they, they might not be able to make a difference for, for somebody else. So we have to be able to go out there, teach our patients because our patient is going to be a sister, a mom, a friend, to be able to say, that's not right. 
that's that, not right. That is so good. And, you know, so much that we learn in the Black community is, is communal, like conversations, informal conversations. And if that information is not right or not shared or not known at all, um, but there's so much power when it is right. Like we, we can share, we can help, we can heal um, and get and at least get the right care that we, we need it. Um, so that's really powerful to make sure that we're telling, we're getting the right information and mm -hmm. doctor as teacher. Wow. I, I, very few, very few. I can feel, uh, but thank God for my, my black primary doctor who has been phenomenal in that. And I feel like she listens and to everything, every. Thing I'm feeling is valid and seen and heard um, and it's kudos to you as well. Let's talk a little bit about reproductive health. So people who aren't pregnant yet, um, who just want to manage their, their reproductive uh, processes, let's talk first about birth control because baby, listen, what you told me about birth control blew my mind. Like, blew my mind. <laughs> Blue mama, and we have a lot of women, a lot of questions that I've gotten from black women informally, and once we posted this, was about fibroids, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, that a lot of women under 40 are going through fibrosis, is that how you pronounce it? Um, well, fibroids. Mm -hmm. Fibroids. So right. let's talk about birth control, uh, and and you can teach. Okay, so <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me teach. So let's I always say, let's take it back a little bit. So let's take it back to what's natural, okay? Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to be natural. We on team natural. Everybody be natural. Everybody well, natural. right. <laughs> uh, under here is natural, I promise you. But <laughs> but um, natural women, if we go back to what we're designed to do with no with no um, special medicine, you know, no technology, we're meant to basically be pregnant um, probably by 16, okay? We're meant to have about, 10 babies, okay, if you think about your great-grandmothers, we're definitely, you know, they have a lot of babies, okay, because there'd be no birth control. We're meant to breastfeed for about two years on these children because there's no formula without scientific invention, okay, mm -hmm. and modern, modern technology. So if you start at 16 and you have 10 babies and each, and so that's one whole year that you're not having a period because you, you're pregnant. So that's 10 years of no period. Now, add on if you exclusively breastfeed uh, with no baby food, no, you know, you're just chewing up the food once they're old enough to get it. That's also probably at least another one to two years where you're not having a period and not ovulating, okay? Mm. When you're not having a period and you're not ovulating, meaning pregnant and breastfeeding, your estrogen levels kind of, kind of stay stable, okay? So we're meant to be kind of in a stable estrogen field between our 20s, 30s, and 40s, okay? Because we're meant to be childbearing. Mm -hmm. So we're meant to have maybe 20 periods our whole life, okay? Because guess what? You start having a period at 13, or maybe 13, 14, you get pregnant at 16, right? When your period finally comes back two years later because you've been breastfeeding, guess what? You get pregnant again because there's no condoms, okay? Then you do it all over again, and you keep doing that until all of a sudden you stop having a period and you're in menopause, okay? Mm -hmm. But we don't do that because nobody wants to have 10 babies anymore. And we're able to work. So we're able to, you know, go out. And if we're on our period, we can use a tampon or a pad or whatever. So we can, you know, we don't have to be constantly having babies for 10 years. So by not having babies until you're in your 30s is unnatural. Okay? Wow. Let's, 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 I know yeah, I'm blowing somebody's mind. What? Everybody, that was That's me. Not natural. And I didn't, I didn't have babies since I was 31. But that's not what my body wants to do. Mm. Every month you have a period is your body's failure to get pregnant. It's wow. trying. So your ovaries go through this whole rigmarole to try to get you to ovulate. And then you ovulate. And then it's like, dang, didn't get pregnant. So it has a period. And it does it month after month, year after year. Okay? So birth control is something that we've developed to prevent pregnancy but it also reduces the amount of bleeding in periods and it reduces the amount of ovulations that you have over your lifetime when you're not trying to get pregnant okay that can protect your ovaries number one so people who are on birth control for long periods of time they um they go into menopause later because they're basically like saving their eggs kind of 
you have less risk of breast cancer and ovarian cancer because your body isn't hit every month with these estrogen spikes. Boom, 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 boom. Your body's at a steady state. So there are reduced risk of that and colon cancer. So we know that if you take birth control, specifically birth control pills, for five years or more, you can reduce your risk of ovarian cancer by half. 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 By 50%. That's that. that if you take birth control. But in our society, oh, no, don't put her on birth control. She's going to be fast. Nah, 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 nah. But we actually, it's actually healthy, and it can help women have a lot more stability mm -hmm. mimicking breastfeeding, which is what we're kind of supposed to be doing in our 20s and 30s and 40s until we're ready to have a baby. Okay? Right. So, and I tell people all the time about periods. Sometimes, some people are lucky. They get a little three-day period, a little cramping. Oh, it's all good. Some people, they feel the ovulation every, every time they feel that ovulation two weeks after their periods. They're cramping, okay? Some people, the natural um, ovulation produces a cyst. And that cyst, when it opens up every month, you get a cyst on one of your ovaries. That's about, it's very small. But sometimes the opening of that cyst can be painful. Sometimes the cyst can get kind of big, okay? This is natural, ladies. A cyst is natural. So if you're constantly feeling, oh, man, I got a, oh, I got a cyst. It's not that something's wrong. It's just that your body was trying to get pregnant and it didn't happen. And so then you released the cyst and the, and the fluid made you have some pain. So the treatment is birth control or right. pregnancy. So if you look at women who've had a lot of babies, four or five babies, they don't have a whole bunch of fibroids traditionally because they've been pregnant a lot. So they mm -hmm. haven't had as many ovulations to grow fibroids, and fibroids are fed by estrogen. Okay? Wow. So if you have what we call unopposed years and years, the, the biggest fibroids we see as OBGYNs are women who may have had either no kids or maybe one kid or something, not on any birth control because their periods wasn't a big deal and they didn't care, and now they have these huge fibroids. Okay? So, and, and it's not just black women that have them, but we do notice that women who um, have a lot of unopposed cycles and non-pregnancies and non-breastfeeders, that they can have higher risk of um, larger fibroids. So, you know, how do you prevent fibroids? You know, everybody's like, well, well, what can I do? Should I be on birth control? Well, there's some people who are on birth control who still have fibroids, but they're usually not humongous, okay? Um, one of the things is that fibroids, we say, can be passengers or problems. Okay. Mm. Some people have fibroids. They find them incidentally on the CAT scan. They're not bothering them. They're not cancer. You live with them. You die with them. You have babies. It's not a big deal. Some women can have fibroids. They can be small depending on where they are. They can cause heavy bleeding, clots, back pain, difficulty getting pregnant, horrible painful periods, and all that kind of stuff. So if your fibroids are becoming, if, if you think you have a fibroid, you need an ultrasound. Mm. Get the measurements. We can see if one's there. I remove small fibroids from women's lining all the time, and that can help them get pregnant, help their periods get regulated. But sometimes fibroids can get big. And so there are doctors who remove fibroids. We have, you know, the technology is constantly changing and improving. So right now, there are some procedures we can do without removing fibroids that can shrink them, but those have not been really approved for women who still want to become pregnant. Okay. So you really need to have a good conversation with a good gynecologist who is listening to you. Okay, because a lot, I get this all the time patients, oh, they said I had some fibroids, but to not worry about it. Well, not that I want you to go and start going crazy worrying, but we need to have a plan. Okay, you're 25. You have a small fibroid on your uterus. Let's, if you start having heavy periods or let's re-image this fibroid every year just to see. Ultrasound mm -hmm. costs, what, 90 bucks, if that. Wow. So you can get it, and that's self-pay. And if you don't have a deductible or something, it's nothing. So you can get an ultrasound just to perform surveillance on your fibroids. Wow. And let's just every year look at it. And every year we look at it, and it still looks the same. Okay? So, you know, you, you just really need a plan for your fibroids. But I think that women need to start really thinking about their fertility when they want to start having children. Um, and, and, it, and not to feel rushed to have children, because there's a lot of other things you can do if you don't have the man yet and you're not sure technology is helping us with egg freezing so if you want to have kids but you know you don't have a partner yet and you got five thousand extra dollars you can go get your eggs frozen 
and they can be there on ice. You usually pay about 200 a month to, to, to store them. Okay. And then if you have trouble getting pregnant, when you do find the man of your dreams, then you can use a frozen egg. About 10 years ago, the quality of frozen eggs wasn't as good. And they were maybe 15 years, they used to want people to only freeze embryos. That means you had to have a man. But guess what? Now, the quality is just the same between eggs and embryos. So you can okay. easily freeze your eggs and have the same chance of getting pregnant versus. So it's giving women a lot more power to, to say, I don't have to rush into getting some such and such. And a lot of other things are becoming popular. Surrogacy, you know, on um, Candy, on um, Real Housewives, getting a lot of Kim Kardashian. So a lot of people, you know, there's there's more options. But, um, you know, it's, it's very difficult to prevent fibroids, okay? Mm. There are some studies that show that, like, yams and like the kind of sweet potatoes people who have a higher diet in those have a higher risk of fibroids and there were some studies in the african cultures and it's because they have a little bit of an estrogen property to them wow. and so the more estrogen you have possibly you're if you have fibroids they can grow more but also um they noticed that in these um in these places that ate a lot of yams in parts of africa they have more twins and it's because they ovulated you know sometimes twice wow. so you know it's it, it's a lot of correlation between things but um, fibroids are, are very patient specific. So you need to make sure that your doctor has a plan for your fibroids. What's my plan? Do I have a plan? Now, if you don't have any heavy periods, you don't have painful periods, and you just chilling, you don't need to get checked for fibroids. It's not something that we, everybody should get an ultrasound. When you get your exam once a year, we do what's called a bimanual exam, where we try to fill your uterus. And if we feel like it's enlarged, then we'll say, hey, let's get an ultrasound. But if it feels small, and most of the time we can kind of know what a uterus feels like, and you're not having any complaints, there's no need to go looking for fibroids. Okay. So we can go. But I was definitely about to be like, let's get this. Let's get these ultrasounds going. Right, right. I don't want everybody to want to get ultrasound. But, <laughs> but, but, but if you're having any issues like heavy periods, very, very painful periods, the pain is not relieved. If you're if you're missing work once a month, that's not what we want. As a gynecologist, mm. I always tell my patient, look. Back in the olden days, women didn't have Tylenol, women didn't have pads, tampons. And when these young girls started their periods, they were out for the count. They couldn't go to school anymore, okay? So that's why a lot of women, you know, back in the olden days didn't go because you're bleeding and you can't just bleed all over everything. So once you started having a period, there was nothing to help you. So you just kind of just, you know, stayed at home and got pregnant or something. So now we have things like pads and tampons and things so that if we're on our period, it doesn't stop our life. Yeah. And that's the whole point of gynecology is that we want to make a woman's womanhood not have to, especially when you're not pregnant, but just the traditional things not stop your life. So that's why we like birth control. You know, we, we don't want you using up all your PTO because you got to take a, a day off every month. We want you to get your period. When you're on your period, it shouldn't be a huge difference in your daily activities than when you're not. Okay. So if you have to take a day off of work every time you have a period, then you're going to get less vacation. That's not good. You shouldn't miss a day of work to go lay in the bed when you could be keeping that money up so you can go on a trip to Brazil. Hey. So if we can help you have a better period where it's not horrible that's what our jobs are that is so amazing um that my last sister <laughs> <said so. laughs> she said, Let's say um hey, what advice do you feel like we should do uh when we go to the, the doctors ourselves man mm -hmm. hey y'all hey i know these, these are howard Apple chapter, you know what? When I posted party, your picture, I got, this is my bestie. This is my line. This, this is my friend. Like, all this. I'm like, what? I haven't seen them in so long. I missed them. <laughs> but yeah, um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So you were well loved by, by <laughs> many because everybody came out the woods. So we love it. Love okay. to see it. Um, so, what questions, what advice do you give us when we go to the doctor? Um, I have. A friend who recently been told that she needs a hysterectomy and she's like 35 uh people are going through you know so many different things it's, it's not even a monitoring or a plan but like how do we go into this doctor situations mm. understanding that you know everybody's not gonna be black you know one friend's talking about traveling to find a black doctor which i get because she lives <laughs> in an area where there aren't um yeah. many i get so, it i get it yeah so, okay. so, 
what, what mm -hmm. how do we advocate for ourselves better what should we be documenting what questions should we be asking uh, what rights do we have as patients we have a lot of rights as patients. So I, I, I tell patients that, you know, my job as a doctor is to find things that will t help you live longer, to find something that could, could kill you and stop you, okay? So let's back up a little bit. Let's talk about hysterectomies a little bit. Hysterectomies used to be like the number one surgery that people got, you know, and when I was in training, um, you know, this was back in like the early 2000s, well, late 2000s. We would see a lot of women, older women, who had hysterectomies. And we're like, well, why did you have a hysterectomy? They're like, I don't know. They just said, take it out. And that would make me so angry because I'm like, did you have cancer? Did you like, well, what happened? I don't know. And so it's a lot of women who've had hysterectomies. Um, hysterectomy, you know, is kind of the, what we usually say is the last option for a woman who's having problems with her uterus. Okay. So if somebody is saying you need a hysterectomy, you either need to have cancer, mm. and that's why you're taking it out, or you need to have had a whole bunch of other stuff tried and it failed. Wow. Not so the right kind of, Right. I say history because, again, the uterus is not an organ to keep you living. It's not like kidneys or something. So a lot of people like to take it out. And one of my, but there's a, if you have a problem with it, but there's lots of things that can be done to fix a problem that's not cancer. Um, there, are, there are so many more devices and things that we can do to help a woman's heavy periods, fibroids, different things that you don't have to go to a hysterectomy. One of my favorite professors, Dr. Nasser, he used to always say, a lot of times doctors will just recommend the same thing. You need hysterectomy, you need hysterectomy. And he said, well, if all you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. Woo. Okay? So if all I know how to do a hysterectomy, then everybody will need one. But if I know that you can have a hysterectomy, you can have a uterine fiber embolization, you can have an ablation, you can have a myomectomy, you can have a this, you can have a that, you can, have, you can put an IUD in, we can do this, then I'm going to offer you all those things. It takes a long time to be able to explain everybody's options, but, you know, you, you, you have to have those options and, and find out what can I do for these things. So, yes, if you go to a doctor, you're kind of like, what do I do? Well, sometimes you, you have to ask other people, like you said, your friend, well, should I do this? A 35-year-old having a hysterectomy, you know, that's not normal. You know, mm -hmm. there has to be something really going on. And they need to be explained that I think this is going to save your life because we tried everything else, and I don't want you to die. Not, I'm tired of you coming to my office complaining about this. Let's take it out. Oof. So so if, if you're having issues, you know, hysterectomy, again, is at the end. But I tell patients, you know, sometimes the hysterectomy is the answer, okay? Because... A, a uterus, like any other organ, your skin, your breast, your brain, your bone can turn into cancer. Okay? Mm. So if we're ever trying to really decide on keeping somebody's uterus, usually you're going to get a biopsy of your uterus, an endometrial biopsy. And that's, again, young women not really doing this. These going to be like over 35, over 40, that we're trying to decide if they can keep their uteruses. So, you know, like I said, why not just take it out? I mean, you don't need it. Because, number one, if you wanted to have children, that's taking your option away. And I'll deliver a patient. My favorite, one of my favorite patients had her first baby at 47, second what? baby at 48. She might be on here. She's my favorite patient. Her and her husband. Oh, my so gosh. Much. A hero. And, then, and it, yes, I delivered um, a few months ago somebody that was 50. What? You know, it is not uncommon to have children later on in life. And if somebody, you know, when to have a hysterectomy is taking that away from you. Okay, it's gone. Now you can still, if you have your ovaries, you can still use a surrogate. Uh -huh. But you, but you have to make sure that the patient is ready to do that. Now, if it's cancer, I'm sorry, ma'am, I do what they do. But if it's not, make sure you've taught, you know, like that, that that doctor knows. Yeah, I'm 40, but I don't have any children. So I always, whenever I look at a patient that like, coming in with heavy peers or something, I first look to see if they have any kids. And if they don't, not that I'm saying you need to have some kids, but I want to say, so what do you think? I don't care. She's 47. So are you, are, do, do you, do you want to have more children? I don't care if they choose to tie. Do you want to have more children? Well, my two is tied. That's okay. You still have a uterus. You, you could carry a baby for your daughter that can't have one. So, mm -hmm. so you, so, so you, so, and we also need to speak up for what we want. I have so many patients that's like, oh, well, you know, this doctor told me I was too old to have kids, so I just got a hysterectomy. Well, you know, are wow. you, you know, so 
you, you've got to be able to advocate for yourself and say, and also I tell my patients this too, I'm sorry, I say, you got to be real with yourself. Ooh. Do you want a child? Ooh. When you come to my office or the OBGYN office, I have no judgment. I'm just trying to help you get what you want. So if you're like, well, you know, I really don't think I'm, you know, I'm going to have children. But do you? Do you want it? Because I'm asking this because we might do something that might destroy your chances of ever having it. Ooh. And if you want it, then let's let, let, let's just open up the conversation. So make sure that when you, you know, that everything that you want is expressed to that doctor. That's I'm 47, true. but you know what? I still just wonder. I'm having periods. You know, I've always wanted to have another baby. I have three boys and I just want a girl. Okay, well, let's talk about it. So um, I think that's, that's one thing. And also kind of knowing that getting second opinions, it's nothing wrong with getting another opinion from another doctor. And, and using technology like Google reviews, um, Yelp, um, personal recommendations. I get so many patients that I get referred to. I had a patient this week, and I'm, I'm in Atlanta, but I'm like outside. I'm like 45 minutes from the city. And I had a patient who had come to me. I've had a patient who's taken an Uber for an hour and a half to come see me. Wow. Because she read on a review that she liked me. And it meant the world to me. But it's also like, you know, just because you live in an area doesn't mean you have to go to the doctors here. Especially with gynecology, it's usually a once a year visit. So if yep. you really like a gynecologist that might be an hour away and you don't have a car and you have Uber or whatever, then, you know, do what you have to do. But if you, but if you're stuck with somebody and you're like, then make sure that your voice is heard, that this is what I want. I don't want to get my uterus out. I know everybody is telling me, you don't need it no more, you get that hysterectomy, but I don't want to. And what else can I do? That is really good. And, you know, I think for, for some too, you know, some people are on Medicaid or Medicare. And so the options may be limited, but even having that power, um, yeah. I think going into our situation is really, um, really strengthening um, to our stories and our narratives that make sure we're on in our stories. And I think what you tapped on really good, I feel like is applicable to anything to really say what we want and not feel like, you know, with this pressure or what other people might think, especially in the doctor's office when it's one-on-one, -on -one, like we need to be vocal about what we want and in, the, in our spaces and get really clear about that. So let's go to Q&A. If you have a Q&A, please drop it in the questions. We'll try to get to as many as we can. I saw a lot of comments. I um, did. I, I saw somebody that said, are you taking new patients? I am taking new patients. So again, I'm in Snellville and Lawrenceville. That's where my offices are. So I'm, I am taking new patients. Um, so now there's a little bit of a wait. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, I see something. Okay, great. So how do we get the respect, attention, and care from our medical professionals? And that's from Jazzy Faye. Okay. So, ooh, that's a hard one. And you know, uh, it's, it's like, can you do it like a trial basis? You know, like when you do find a new therapist, like you kind of have this like intro. Um, but like with doctors, I feel like you go and you kind of, it feels like you're all in, you know? I, you know, it is, it is so difficult. And, you know, especially for me, it's hard for me because I'm, because, because I'm a physician. So at, when I'm a patient, you know, I, but I still have been there where I remember I went to this ENT and he just like, just brushed me off and was like, it, 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 it was just a really like, Ooh, experience and so I and I didn't I was in a rush anyway but um but you know I, I I think what the main thing is from a physician's perspective is tr if you're having an appointment for a problem okay focus on that problem at that visit okay so if you go in and you got a whole bunch of stuff going on you you know you're here for your annual but you got fibroids and you need have pretty heavy periods but you also want to get pregnant and you also scared about breast cancer and you also think you're cysts in your ovaries like sometimes that can be overwhelming for a provider mm -hmm. so if you kind of go in and you and you say you know well i'm here for this but this is what i'm really concerned about and sometimes you need an appointment just to talk about one issue and honestly let me tell you ladies your annual is not always the time to give it all to you. Now, I take it off my patients. I can, I'm good at being, at, you know, figuring out what they need and time management. I'm very good with time management, but not all physicians are. Some get, you know, pushed into a different way and, and they got somebody over here that they're trying to do. So you may need to have multiple visits to talk about things. And a lot of times, especially mm -hmm. with women, let's talk about these annuals. You know, we think that the annual visit is like, 
I hate saying a checkup, but the annual is really a preventative visit. It's a visit to to see to check a non problem person who's having a great life, who just wants to go in and get up and get screened for cervical cancer and get screened for breast cancer. That's the point of your annual exam. So if you have a lot of other issues, you're going to need multiple visits to handle those. And not every provider is good at multitasking that. So you so you may need to say, this is my screen to make sure I don't have breast cancer or cervical cancer. But I also have some some issues I want to talk to you about, about fertility. So they may say, well, draw a couple labs and I'm going to bring you back next week and we're going to dive into that. Okay. So, yeah. So I, I think that, and the, one of the problems with black women is we're busy. So yeah. we're trying to, if I, if I got it, if, you know, and that goes back to America and our, our greed and our, you Ooh. can't have no time off of work to go, to go get your health check. So the one time you got off, a PTO, whatever you got off, and now you got to use to go see the doctor, you know, you're trying to get it all in one. So, you know, you, you may have to take time for your health. I see so many women, I'm here, I, I, got, I got to go right back to work. Well, we, we still got some talking to do. That is so real. And, you know, and maybe the way you break it down is like, like we approach therapy. It's not a one-time thing where you go and you try to get all your problems fixed in one session. It's like continuous and there's a series of it. And maybe that's how we should begin to think about like how we approach our physical health as yeah. well. It shouldn't, it's not usually just a one time, you know, when people have your one visit a year, that's those little 21 year olds that's just there for a birth control refund and moving on, <laughs> getting a, you know, chlamydia test just to make sure they're good. But once you get to a certain age where you've got other things, you're going to need multiple visits. You know, we your blood pressure might be high. We need to talk about that. You know, I, I have a lot of conversations about women when we talk about family history of cancer. And we start coming up with a plan. So, you know, um, breast cancer, of course, can affect black women, you know, yeah. more severe. So I told you all the time myself, I have one of the breast cancer genes. I have BRCA1 gene. Wow. And so... I got tested because I have family history and yeah. I created a plan, you know, with me and my doctor, which is really myself and my best friend, <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> what we were going to do, you know, I'm going to get a mammogram every year. I'm going to get my CA-125 check here. I'm going to do this. So, but that's one of the things that I like to do is to let's come up with your breast cancer plan. And then just so patients know, if you have a family, anybody can get a mammogram at any time. Insurance starts covering them at 40. If you have a family history, you a lot of insurances will pay for your mammograms yearly starting at 25. Oh, wow. If you have a family history and you test positive for one of the genes, you should start starting your mammograms at 25. Okay. So I had the gene. I didn't know it until I was like 33. So I was, you know, some some years back, you know, seven, you know, some some years that I didn't know. But once I did know, then I created my plan for my screening. And so that's what one of the other things about going to the doctor is you need to create your plan for what we need to do to make sure you can live as long as possible. And we're at the two minute mark. So let us know if you have any questions. Uh, but the same thing too, I feel a lot about having the plan for, uh, for breast cancer. Ananda uh, Lewis from Team Summit, who was yes. an idol to me growing up, recently shared her story about how she avoided it. So I think even that's a call to us as black women to make sure that we are taking care of ourselves, doing the, mm -hmm. the pieces that we know uh, work and help um, make sure that we're holding our, our sisters and our friends, and our girlfriends accountable too. And maybe make it a thing, you know, are we all gonna go get our mammograms, you know, this, yes. week or this month or whatever, and yes. make sure, you know, we, we hold each other accountable. Yes, this is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So this is October. And if you are 40 and up, you should get a mammogram every 12 months. If you have a family history of breast cancer, you should be getting a mammogram every year, really starting if you have the gene for it at 25. And you should at least be getting a, a breast exam by a, 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 some type of medical practitioner um, yearly. And if you feel something, please don't be afraid to get it checked out. The thing about breast cancer, is if it's found in stage one, it is 95% curable. Wow. That is basically curable. When you get a 95% cure rate, it's basically curable. So if we can find it, you shouldn't be afraid to find it. You should want to find it. So you can find it and treat it and get it over with. All right. Last question. We have how far before having kids should you start taking prenatal vitamins? 
So the main point of taking prenatal vitamins is to have enough folic acid. Folic acid is the is the vitamin that if you don't have enough of, it can cause issues with the baby's spinal cord. It's very rare for American people to have low folic acid levels because um, the United States decided, hey, we don't want anybody to have problems with folic acid. So they started. We're about to cut out. We're about to cut up. But. <laughs>